after. Oh, I wasn't allowed in Manchester in my teenage years. <laughs> I stayed mainly in my um, my own region of town, which was um, which was Withingshaw. We didn't venture too much into the centre of Manchester at 15 years old. Um, Withingshaw, which is a very green and pleasant part of South Manchester, kind of um, hung out there, really. Very bleak, very dark. Uh, dirty. Um, it was the tail end of, um, you know, they'd only stop people using coal as fuel in their homes to heat their homes and they'd introduce smokeless fuel. So all the buildings were black, you know, from all the, 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 the soot from the smoke. Of unemployment. Um, uh, and a lot of people became musicians because there was a good music scene. And lots of places were putting on bands. The punk scene sort of gave a lot of opportunities for people who didn't really know what they wanted to do, but uh, became musicians or, you know, kind of musicians. <laughs> Formed bands, basically, and lots of little labels independent labels uh, started to put out records, you know. So it was a great, really good scene and good time to be in a band. Yeah, lots of empty buildings um, with no businesses in. So at the time it was very easy to get a rehearsal room space, you know, all bands had their own rehearsal room space. Whereas now bands tend to rent spaces by the hour, then you rent it spaces by the week or by the month, you know. My dad was driving and my mother worked for the... Um, uh, she had several jobs actually, but she worked um, in schools and she also worked in the National Health Service. I, I originally come from Lancaster, which is near, not near to Manchester. My parents moved to Oldham, which is in Greater Manchester. And I lived there till I was four years old. And then uh, my parents emigrated to South Africa. So I lived in South Africa till the age of 15 and then came back to Manchester. And I just finished the last year of school before I became an, an apprentice electrician. Um, and, you know, coming from South Africa to the UK was amazing for me because of all the music in the UK, and then the punk thing happened. When I was growing up, the mad, uh, she had Penny Lane by the Beatles, and on the flip side of Strawberry Fields, uh, she had a, a great groovy EP by Ray Charles, which had Take These Chains From My Heart on it, and um, Your Cheating Heart. Uh, I learned, and it was a really good, it was a little seven inch, but it was a, a, a photograph. It had four tracks on it, it was a seven inch EP. Uh, and the photo on the front was Ray Charles getting arrested for smoking weed. He was, get, he was going into a, a police car with a handcuffs on. <laughs> My brother was a big influence on me because he used to buy a lot of records. And in the 60s, he was a Rolling Stones fan. He hated the Beatles and liked the Rolling Stones. But he used to come home with uh, new records ev every week and um, one of the first records I sort of remember liking was Son of My Father by Chicory Tip. Um, but as, as I got older, uh, I remember one school teacher in assembly played Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, which I really, I thought, wow, what's that? And then got into bands like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. But then also living in South Africa, uh, there used to be a radio station called Radio Band 2. And I used to like listening to the South African um, black music there, which I also liked as a teenager. Roxy Music, um, Mark Bolan, David Bowie, those kind of guys, yeah. Uh, pop music, Slade that kind of thing. But at the same time, I was listening to um, different forms of jazz as well. 
kind of Stanley Clark, um, listening to Chikoria, listening to Herbie Hancock. So it was a big mix. Before Donald came into the band, um, our musical taste was quite eclectic. We used to go to a place, place called Pip's Discotheque uh, that would play things like um, Kraftwerk, Brian Eno, Roxy Music, David Bowie. Jez was listening to Northern Soul. Um, Simon was buying funk records. I was buying jazz records. So it, the funk thing was, was, was important, but it wasn't the only thing. The pop group was a big influence on us, and the pop group were quite a funky band. When I met the guys, they were still, they were listening to the same things I was kind of listening to, you know, George Duke, um, Parliament, you know, Funkadelic, James Brown, you know, that kind of thing. I wanted a guitar, and me and my dad found a guitar in the newspaper second hand. It was a Watkins Rapier Deluxe guitar and we went and bought the guitar and shortly after I bought the guitar in 1975, shortly after punk happened, which was great for me because with punk you didn't really have to learn to play the guitar, you only needed one bar chord. And I remember going round to a friend's house after school and um, uh, the Clash album had just come out and his big brother taught me how to play White Riot on the guitar. But just on instruments, sorry, before the guitar, I played the trumpet at school, yes, so in the brass band. So I didn't, you know, when you play the trumpet at school, when you reach puberty, you're embarrassed because it's not a very cool instrument in the brass band. So I then wanted to um, I, I didn't want to play the trumpet anymore. Um, I was one of those hyperactive ch children that um, was always buzzing around and always playing with knitting needles and pretending to drum and everything. And um, my brother kind of recognised this and <laughs> went out one day and bought me a drum kit, which was a kind of a wild thing to do because they were pretty expensive then. Um, and he just thought it might be a good idea that might be a good thing for me to try and calm me down and maybe I had the potential to, to drum. And he was the first one that kind of saw that. I bought one off a friend that I, I, when I was working uh, and I couldn't play it. And, but then, um, and I was living with a guy called Gordon the Moron who was in a band called Jilted John who had a single on Rabid Records which got to number three. I think that might have been prior to Spiral Scratch as well, Buzzcocks. <clears throat> it was on a, a label called Rabid Records in Manchester. Um, and they asked me to play on top of the pops, but I couldn't even mime it, I, was, I couldn't play. But then a few years later, uh, yeah, I got into a certain ratio and uh, we played quite a few gigs at Band on the Wall. Well, most of the bands in Manchester started because you got a free gig, the Arts Council, supported a, a, a night at this club and so Joy Division, The Fall, all those bands started there because they got a free gig. Band on the Wall was a jazz venue in Manchester and on I think it was Monday nights they had a thing called the Manchester Musicians Collective so the Manchester Musicians Collective would use Band on the Wall and you had to join the Manchester Musicians Collective and then if you joined your band could get gigs at the Manchester Musicians Collective and we used to have meetings to decide who was playing the, 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 in the, over the next few weeks. Uh, Warsaw were part of it, a certain ratio, um, the fall, the Manchester Mekon, um, the Passage. So there was a, there was quite a few bands um, in the collective and the main people at the collective were the other bands. So the other bands would watch the bands, yeah. So it was, it was good, a really good, uh, you know, creative training ground, really. My first rehearsal was at Jez's mum and dad's house and what happened was uh, Pete and Simon had already written a, a 
I think about five or six early ACR songs. And then Jez saw them at a gig, gig and Jez joined. And then I saw them at the first gig with Jez and then I joined and I went to a rehearsal. We had one rehearsal and I learned all the songs and we did, a, uh, I think we did a gig at Band on the Wall or Pips, I can't remember. But um, the songs were really easy and, and my, you know, Pete's guitar and my guitar were like opposite. So the two guitars worked really well together. Um, yeah, I can't, I think it was probably a song called Geno, Genotype, Pheno, Phenotype was the first song I played. Rob Gretton, who saw us at Band on the Wall, I think Joy Division were playing and we were playing the same night as them. And Rob saw us play and he said to Tony, oh, you've got to get this man to play the Russell Club, which is the factory. Uh, and we did, and on that night, after that night, I think it was the four we played with, uh, and that night he asked us to do a single. Would you like to make a, a record, release a record? So we said, yeah, okay. So we went in the studio and made the record and Tony asked if he could manage us. The first seven inch single, the prior to that there'd been the, uh, the double seven inch single, Factory Sampler. But then I think our, our next, our single, All Night Party was the first seven, you know, single. I never wanted to like form my own band or do anything like that. It, it, that kind of thing comes along when you find like-minded like people, you know? Because um, ratio, I didn't know any ratio, but I knew, uh, there was a friend of mine, uh, Toby, that knew um, Anthony Wilson, because he played in Ludus. Tony had a TV show. I used to watch Tony's TV show. And then one day, um, about 40 minutes after watching him on TV, he knocked on my door, which was quite amazed at because I'd just seen him on TV live. And uh, yeah, came through, talked to me about, you know, what ratio I wanted, what ratio I wanted to do, etc. And we uh, just formed a friendship and a partnership from that moment on, really. I, I, to this day, I still think, where did Tony Wilson get the time and energy to do what he did? Because he was a full-time journalist, you know, and he worked at Granada TV, and that was a full-time job. And in between doing his full-time job, he was running the factory. People always say that Factory Records was unorganised, but Tony had ideas, and he knew exactly what he wanted to do, and he, he did it, you know. He was the mouthpiece, really, Tony, yeah. He surrounded himself by other good people who could make his vision happen. So, who am I going to get to make my records sound good? Martin Hannett. Who am I going to get to make my uh, records look good? P um, Peter Saville. Um, who am I going to get to, 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 to find good bands and who knows? who's really good at, with a good knowledge of music. Um, Rob Gretton, I've got a full-time job, I can't do everything. How am I going to do everything? Alan Erasmus. Rob Gretton was the, the pragmatist. Rob Gretton, funny. Uh, Pete Savile was a uh, designer. <laughs> Peter Savile, late. Martin Hannett, crazy. Yeah, a great producer and uh, Quite, uh, quite unique. Alan Erasmus, um, uh, erratic, <laughs> but really, I mean, good erratic, you know. He would always be running around um, um, doing things. Factory was like, it was like a family, you know, that, that touring, and, and we did a lot of gigs together. I mean, we'd be in London, like, every, four weeks, every six weeks, we'd be doing a different gig in London. Uh, we used to do gigs with uh, Section 25, Orchestral Maneuvers, Jerutic Column, and we'd change around the the, the, um, the bands that were playing at each thing. Well, George Division uh, were just full of great energy. Um, Steve Morris, I used to, I still do, I still love watching Steve Morris drum. He's got, um, 
you know, he's, he's got a vibrancy about him that was fantastic. Um, and just all the elements, you could see all the elements come together. Hooky with Barney, with Bernard, and, um, and Ian, and Steve. It was just wonderful to watch. But the, the, the great thing about them at that time, remember, they wasn't as big as they are now. <laughs> yeah, there was nowhere near that. Um, but what was really nice about the guys was they didn't have a, you know, they might be, we might be booked into a concert and they're the, the, the headline, so to speak, but they never walked around like they were a headline act. They would switch things around. They'd say, you guys go on today because we're going to Brighton tomorrow or something, you know, and want to get off early and that, that kind of thing. They were very, um, those guys have always throughout their career been very um, kind of good to uh, other artists like ourselves. You know, we did we did quite a few gigs with them and you got to know their songs inside out and you're hearing the songs before they recorded and seeing Ian perform. Um, and they just you just knew that uh, they had something that was unique, you know, um, like all the factory, factory acts did. Uh, but, uh, you know, Joy Division just happened to make a brilliant album, which was Unknown Pleasures, which uh, the critics can't help but say, this, this is a great album, you know. And the timing was just perfect for them. Especially Ian's performances were, yeah, magnetic. People couldn't, yeah, he was, he was, they were the, sort of the best band, tightest band. But, uh, you know, we followed closely behind. Oh, well, we never thought we were following closely behind, but uh, it seems that the press and everybody else <coughs> always put a second. <laughs> there's lots of things that Steve did live, going back to being drummers now, there's a lot of things that Steve did live that wasn't on the record, and it was those things I used to like. I used to, you know, seeing him do the things that, that w weren't on there. And uh, every time, he used to do those live all the time, and, and they were special for me because I knew they wasn't part of that recording and I knew I was seeing something special every night. The Graveyard and the Ballroom came out as a cassette only. It grabbed a lot of attention because it was a cassette only album. And at that time, nobody released cassette only albums, you know. And the plastic purses that it was in was unique. Yeah, no, that was, uh, I, mean, I think it was the first cassette only album. Plastic wallet that it was in, which was one of Tony Wilson's ideas and the different colour plastic wallets, it grabbed quite a lot of attention. Uh, and of course, it had some great songs on it, like um, Do The Do Flight. But I think the, the thing that grabbed the most attention for us around that time was the John Peel sessions, which really helped propel the band. There's two moments. There's when you first get it and you see it because you've got the test press in them and you get to see it before everybody else does and that moment when it's released and everybody else then starts to see it. Back in the day, it was reviewed in papers and that, that was the way, you know, in um, music magazines and music papers. So that was the way you knew that the information got out, you know, and then, sorry, there's a third one, obviously, when you go into a shop and then you see it there for real, you know, um, that's also uh, quite a big moment for you. Got, and Simon's old girlfriend always says that it's her that gave him a copy of Shack Up. So Simon will say that he found a copy of Shack Up at Yanks, but his girlfriend says it was her that had the record and lent it to him. But funnily enough, when we did the cover version of Shack Up, um, it had trumpets in it, and the trumpet was really easy, two notes. Du -du 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 -du. And me and Simon both played trumpet at school, so we decided to, to buy trumpets. And I went to Johnny Roadhouse, a second-hand music shop in Manchester, and bought a cheap trumpet. And we recorded the trumpets on Shack Up, and then from then on, ACR used trumpets, you know. One of the great things about going to New York, besides 
seeing New York, seeing all the places on TV that you, you've seen before, you know, with the cop chases, et cetera, et cetera. And back then you had, you had the World Trade Center, so that, that was there, a massive central focus, you know, in, the, in, um, in Manhattan. What for me was brilliant was being able to go into these um, small clubs and listen to fantastic PA systems that were just, that just sounded incredible. And then, and hear these, these new sounds, you know, that, that were, that were um, coming together, you know, the, that whole hip hop thing and, and whatever. Um, but I think we were listening to it then before it had the name hip hop. I don't think it was called hip hop then. Anyway, um, to hear those great um, uh, records, that were just kind of New York based, you know, that all, all started from there, you know, the Africa Bambata kind of thing. And, uh, you know, those, those things was just fantastic. Tony Wilson said, um, do you want to go to New York to record a new album? <laughs> so we said, mm, okay then. So we all had jobs and obviously had to get time off work and stuff. And we went to New York and Tony hired a, a loft in Tribeca and we bought mattresses, sheets, pillows and we just stayed on the floor in the loft and it was September so it was quite warm and we did a few gigs and recorded the album in East Orange in New Jersey. Yes, Madonna. Um opened for us then, and she was, I believe, a hat check girl in uh, the club, Danceteria. And we played upstairs in a place called Congo Bills. Um, yeah, she's a very strong character. Um, when we met, well, my alt <laughs> I had a major altercation with her when she first met because she came in the room and she did the whole, right, all this is, has to be moved. You know, we set up all the equipment and everything. All this has to go. And we're like, what? She said, oh, no, all this has to go. I've got my dancers. We're doing this, 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 this. Cause she didn't, she was um, running um, playback with the vocals and dancing. And, 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 you know, that was the way she was doing it. Uh, art at the time. I don't think she, she had a band. I believe she was a drummer then. I think she drummed and everything. She was finding a musical feat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and yes, we had um, somewhat of an altercation. Sex tech. Because it was the one that we did uh, and we didn't use Martin Hallett. Uh, so we sort of got across our vision of what we were doing. And I just think that a lot of the tunes weren't written, we actually wrote them in the studio. Uh, and so I think it's got something that the other albums haven't got. It's like a, it's quite jazzy and people, it was slagged off when it came out. But then 2000 and whatever, nine, it came out, it was re-released. It's like got praise, you know. I like Sex Tech because it's the first album that we produced and it's got some brilliant songs on there and we, you know, we just, we used the studio and just experimented in there. We didn't have anyone telling us what to do and we just, the chemistry was great. We had Mark, we had Tilly with us, um, Simon had wanted to sing less and having a, a, a female vocalist who wrote really good lyrics with a great voice. Me and Simon could just concentrate on trumpets more. It's just, it's a great album, yeah, that's my favourite. But I suppose the Flight 12 inch with Blown Away on is really good as well, which is the other side of ACR, which was produced by Martin Hannett which is the best stuff that he did with us. Today, tomorrow's different. <laughs> um, I'm gonna choose Force. I'm going to choose Force because I think we kind of, 
went down a different avenue then. It was the first time we were kind of, jazz was really at the apex of writing uh, great lyrics. I mean, he still does. He still blows me away with the, all the lyrics he writes now, but he was getting his vocal together as well. I mean, jazz didn't really want to be the singer after Simon left. <laughs> Again, it's the same as, it's probably exactly a replica of Barney's syndrome, you know, except for Ian passed. Um, and it took him a few years to, to develop getting into that. And I think Force was that strike point for me when I think Jez was, was on the money vocally, you know. And I just think the band was as well, like super tight. We were co-producing with, um, with a friend of ours who's now passed, Stuart James. Uh, and we're trying all different things. We had an S900, you know, as first sampler that we used on, on, on that record and everything. I'd just been there as the bass player and enjoyed standing at the back. Uh, and just jamming with the drummer, forced to go to the front and sing. And it's like, no, I really didn't. It took me about 20 years to feel comfortable there. And at times now, I still don't feel comfortable. But hey, we're not, I'm not like a lead front man, you know, because we're all, we, we all change instruments and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, that's a problem because it, usually the singer is the star or whatever, or the focal point. Well, whereas the focal point of our band is the whole band which I think that's the problem with people. You know, they like stars, they like, you know, they like a lot of crap, really. <laughs> when we finished Force, which was a, a really good album, we did the biggest tour we've ever done around Europe. It was six weeks. We started in Scandinavia and worked our way down. Went all through every country in Europe. <laughs> but in, in, in all the countries that they didn't, Force wasn't ready. They didn't have it. So we, we, weren't, we were not happy about that because we'd made a really great album, planned a tour to promote it, and people couldn't get the record. So I think that was the start of us thinking, hmm, Factory aren't doing a good job for us here. Um, we also found it increasingly difficult to get money they owed us out of it. They didn't have any books for us, you know, uh, and the tax man wanted money off us and was saying, well, where's our accounts? And they went, what accounts? <laughs> Certain ratio was selling a lot of albums at the time, and I think our wage was forty pound each a week. So each of us got forty pound, and the reason we got forty pound was because forty pound a week was the tax threshold. If you earn forty pound a week, you didn't have to pay any tax. Yeah. So that was Tony Wilson's idea, and we got forty pound a week. Um, and when it got to force, we, we were finding it difficult to get money, our royalties off factory. So we just agreed with them that, listen, that we'll take our masters and we'll, we'll go elsewhere. So, but we left with all our material and the masters to all our material. Uh, and I think that, um, in the long run has stood as good because we're independent now. Um, you know, we're with Mute Records, but we, we make the albums ourselves and we pay for them ourselves and then take them to a label with Mute at the moment and they, they, we ask them if they want to put it out and they're happy to put it out and we're having a really good relationship with Mute at the minute. So we left Factory and we wanted to look for a major deal because we we wanted to get to the next stage financially yeah which was maybe the wrong decision because uh, although when we did sign to AM we built our own studio we were quite comfortable financially 
but A and M were they were a label that were on a decline, and as they were declining, we had to decline with them. So um, it wasn't successful. But what was successful was we made two great albums, and to me, ACR MCR is one of our finest pieces of work. It's an album I feel really close to personally, and we recorded it in our own studio. Um, yeah, so Good Together was a really commercial album made in, costing a lot of money, made with a producer. And ACR, MCR is a reaction to that album that didn't cost anything because we did it in our own studio, but it was a lot more successful than the one that cost a lot, lot of money. Yeah, do you want to be a pop star? I don't want to be a pop star, I want to be a musician. Okay, well, you are a musician. Do you want to become a pop star? No, no pop we want to sell music, you know. Yeah. We want to sell music so that enough people hear it. Because the big frustration for a musician is when no one knows him. Well, it was originally called The Big E, um, and it was a very poppy single. And one of the things w that we consciously thought of when we signed to A&M was, right, we signed to a, a major label, we've got the machinery, the marketing and the tools that you need to, to, to produce a hit single, let's use it and see what happens. Unfortunately, the label didn't really get behind us. Uh, we had a major disaster. We made a brilliant video for the Big E and the week before the single was going to be released, uh, the, uh, we, we, the video was on a boat on the ri River Thames, a party on a boat, and a party on a boat that on the River Thames uh, um, sank and loads of people died. So we had to pull the video. So all the luck was just taken away. Any luck that we might have had was taken away from us. Um, and, you know, it, a, 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 a song that should have been a hit wasn't a hit. Um, but it's just part of our progress and our history. I won't stop loving you. It's more the pop side of what we do, yeah. uh, and I kind of like that really because I think that throws that throws people off because they hear that and it's like, whoa, that doesn't sound like Winter Hill, you know, that that kind of thing. And that's what I like. We, we keep doing that all the time. There's a pop side, there's a funk side, there's a jazz side, there's a Latin side, you know. There's um, Hopefully, there might be a hip hop side. You know, you never know. That's that's mixed in with the with the next kind of things that are coming along. Yeah. There's quite a few other pop songs as well, but um, that's the one that people remember. But yeah, we've always had a problem with our public persona, uh, which is a good thing, really, because, you know, once people know what you are, it's like they just forget it. You know, you, that's what you are and that's it. Uh, but, I mean, for us, it's about, and but for most bands, it's about the people who like them and their fans play for them, you know. Uh, all the other stuff is, you know, people comparing you and journalists writing crap about you, you know. It's just like, it doesn't really, it used to upset me, but it doesn't anymore. We, we, it, we enjoy what we're doing. And um, so, yeah, I think we're, we're, I think we're quite misunderstood, actually, as a band. And people think we're aloof and so we're not. We're just, you know, we're just passionate musicians who are always moving forward and trying to create new music, which is why, you know, after four years, the last album is probably one of the best albums. Actually, it wasn't the meeting. The first time I spoke to her was on the phone. 
yeah, the first time I spoke to her, I was on the phone and it was, and I remember um, finding out who she was and, and, and what she did, etc. and got a number. And I was then asking her to, to, I think, come along to the studio, come and meet, come and do something with us. There was, there was the thing. And she turned us down. <laughs> because she already had something else that was being done. It was Martin who introduced Denise uh, to us. Um, a Fifth of Heaven, I heard that track, uh, which I really liked. I can't remember the first gig she did with us, but no, as soon, I, when, as soon as I heard her voice, she was great. And her personality, she was such a warm personality. She made everyone feel good. I'd like to dedicate this tune to Denise Johnson, who was our singer for 30 years. She passed away last year. This one's dedicated to her. <coughs> Dave Rolf is a good friend of mine. I work with him making patch bays for Amec. And his girlfriend was Denise Johnson. And he had a record label called DFM. And he wanted me to produce a, a tune on DFM by um, Ashley and Jackson called uh, Solid Gold. I got Denise to come and sing backing vocals on that. And around the same time, he also wanted me and Donald to uh, do a record with him. So we had our own studio, and he wanted to use the studio to make a record. And, and because he wasn't a musician, he wanted me and Donald to become involved. And that was Acid to Ecstasy by ED209 and he got Denise singing on that and that's how we met Denise. Because A&M were on a decline and that financially they weren't doing too well, they had to drop quite a lot of bands and we were one of the bands they dropped. So we'd had our advance and everything, took everything and said bye-bye. Um, and Rob Gretton, uh, we, uh, we went to see Rob and said, can we put some tunes out on your label? And he went, yes, please. And we had a great relationship with Rob and released some really good stuff on his label. Sadly, Rob passed away, which for us was devastating because Rob really looked after us. Um, although he wasn't managing us, he was our, our mentor and he did sort of manage us in a way. And when he passed away, uh, we were just at, left out in the wilderness, and that's why we stopped doing things. We had a, we sort of had a break in 1990 when Rob died uh, and Rob's records folded. We sort of we sort of you know we knew we'd get back together at some point, but um, yeah, we had a long break then, seven years or something, eight years, until Soul Jazz put out an album, and we got back. They asked us to play a gig, which we did. Uh, and um, that got us sort of started again. Uh, and that's what led to doing that album I made up in our spare time. <laughs> and playing, you know, six or seven gigs a year when we're invited to nice gigs. We record when it's right. We've never forced it. We've never, um, that, and if you look in our career, you'll see big lulls. Yeah, I think it's actually, if I'm right, it was 11 years between, 11, nearly 12 years between the last album and Loco. And I know that because the Doves did the same thing. The Doves had a, the same gap. We re literally released the record a few months apart after that many years together. So that's the only reason it really sticks. Um, yeah, it's just, you record when, when, it, when the time's ready. We've never ever forced being in the studio because it just doesn't work. So Loco, ACR Loco came about because we were doing a lot of reworks for other people and, the, and when, when we signed to Mute, it was for a uh, back cat, catalogue only deal. And Mute asked us to do a rework of Barry Adams and I've Got Clothes and we went in the studio, did that. And then because that got played on the radio quite a lot, 
other people started asking us to do rework. So we started doing lots of reworks. And we were working in a studio in Manchester called Oxygen, doing these reworks. And the more we did, the more people asked us to do them. And we were making all these great records for other people. And while doing it, we were really enjoying working in the studio and coming up with all these great ideas. And we thought, hmm, hold on a minute, why aren't we making our own tunes instead of making these tunes for other people? So it gave us a bit of training doing those reworks and getting back into it. When we met Mute, met up with Mute, and they got the back catalogue, it sort of gave us the impetus to carry on and go, oh, OK, well, yeah, we've got loads more music in us. Uh, we're not really doing anything different from what we did before, which is just take all the influences that we've been listening to and, and you know, write some new music. Well, the writing process is, is a number of different things. It could be people coming in with ideas, us jamming in the studio together, um, just lots of different formulas pulled, uh, kind of loco together, and we just, we just kept rolling uh, with that. You know, I started booking time in the studio and, 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 and booking the time and saying, right, we need to go, in. we've got these dates booked, we need to come up with some ideas. So we'd get in the studio and just start writing in the studio. Um, and the tunes just started coming out really quick. What happened was on our 40th anniversary tour, we invited um, Daniel Miller to come and DJ at our gig in Manchester. And my plan was, one, when I got Daniel on his own, was to say, we've got a top new album, we've got a really good album. Because we told Paul who we worked with at Mute, but Daniel makes all the decisions, so... I told him that we'd been working on this really good album. We were really happy with it and we wanted to put it out. So he didn't say anything. He just went back to London and on Monday I got an email off Paul saying, we want to come and listen to the album. So um, we played the album to, to them and they really loved it. And that's how Loco came about. EPA is Jams, and that was with all six of us, and Denise's last recording with us. C um, is Collaborations. So obviously we, uh, you know, the people that we like, who <laughs> we want to collaborate with, and ask them to do, we want to do things, you know, Emperor Machine, etc. So that, that was a collab collaboration phase of that. An EPR was, we just needed to do another EP, so we just recorded five songs. And every song is a totally different style of music. EPR could be five different bands, actually, the five tracks on there. It's very eclectic. Um, and I think that the, the three EPs would have made an amazing album, you know. <laughs> then thought, okay, wouldn't it be a good idea to, to keep that 
um, kind of format again, but ask people that we like to um, give us their version of how they see those tunes, you know? Um, and that's what we did. We didn't have any, didn't have any rules, regulations, tempo times, feels, anything. We had none, none of that. The only one thing that we wanted to do with that record was have at least more than 50% of it um, be also remixed by female uh, artists. Yeah. 